So hello, uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is uh, Harry and I'm a process leader within the leather department at Rolls-Royce Motorcars. Um, today I'll be going through the layout and properties of the leather covering station as you can see here on my poster. Um, the leather covering station is essentially where they um, get the leather which is already sewn and they adhere it to the plastic carrier part. It might be a door panel, an instrument panel, anything like that. Um, I'll also um, discuss how um, the layout and properties of the station add to the productivity of the business and also the well-being of the staff. Um, so to start off with, I'm going to go through the process flow. I'm in a very simple process flow for um, the leather covering station. Um, so to start off with, they collect their leather and their plastic carrier part from the preparation trolley. Um, the preparation team essentially spray heat activated glue on it, let it dry and then it comes out of the dryer the other side ready for the uh, leather covers to pick it up. Um, they then go to their workstation which is here, they then cover the part in the leather using the um, heat gun in order to activate the glue and manipulate the leather. Um, they then have small bits of assembly that they must do afterwards. Um, and then they do a quality inspection on the part to ensure that it reaches all of the quality requirements that specific part. Um, they then decide has it reached the quality specification. If it hasn't, they then start the process again and they need to redo the whole process to remake the part. Or if it's good enough, yes, they put it in the delivery process <coughs> to go down to the assembly yards. Um, so at the station, um, the lighting, obviously part of the environment um, that they work in, um, we now have a minimum of 1,000 lux of light at the surface of each workbench. Um, we did a study um, within the leather shop about two years ago and the average amount of lux per workbench was about 300 which isn't very good. So um, we just installed new lighting in the past year and a half to ensure that at each workbench on the surface, even when somebody's sitting down, that there'll be a minimum of 1,000 lux at each workbench. What prompted that study? Um, so when we were seeing failures, some of the associates were saying we couldn't um, see the defect within the leather shop. So um, we tested them on it, we got the parts out of the vehicles that were defective, brought them up to the leather shop, put them on the workbench, and we found that some of the defects that were being found by auditors, actually you couldn't see in the leather shop because the lighting was poor on the benches. Um, so it was the fact that we were shipping faults, not knowingly shipping faults. So it was something that could be improved to stop us from moving faults forward. And how did you hear what the associates were saying? Uh, just for associate feedback. So whenever we get a um, point from our auditors, the first thing we do is go and look at the process um, and have a chat with the associates to see what they think could have gone wrong as they're the experts. So, and then you said you conducted a study. What yes. did that study comprise? Uh, it essentially comprised of um, a layout of the shop floor with every single workbench on it and a... Um, a light monitor put on each work, workbench and the light was tested without an associate sat at the bench and then there was a, another measurement taken of when there was an associate sat at the bench to see if the shadow had any effect on the amount of light that was on the uh, work surface. Thank you. Okay. Um, next we have the uh, heat gun that the associates use. So it's very ergonomic in terms of the handle. Um, Leicester, the um, source company who actually made them, they've done ergonomic studies to work out that that is, in general, the best size handle to have on the heat gun. Um, additional to that, they also supply different ones, which are different weights. So we had, I think, six different heat guns within the leather shop, and we conducted weight trials to see which ones, when moving the heat gun around, which ones the associates thought was lighter and the, the easiest to manoeuvre. So... We essentially let them trial six different ones and pick which ones they thought was easiest for their use. Um, also, from a health and safety perspective, these heat guns, they can heat up to over 500 degrees. Yeah. So um, when they're on the bench, like they are there, obviously the metal part which emits the heat is obviously still quite hot. So we put metal, we put some guards around it. Um, this is based on a high accident frequency rate of... Um, burns so I think we had two or three burns within three months and again from associate feedback they felt like they would be 
better if they had a guard around it when the um, heat gun wasn't in use next to them on the bench because it was they were touching their legs on it yeah. and it was burning them. So we put guards around it so that completely eradicated the health and safety risk. Um, also, in this, the associates um, have the capability to control the heat on a control panel on the top. So they can choose what amount of heat they want to emit out of the uh, out of the top gun at any time. So, what about things such as emissions in that? If you're melting plastic in that, you must have some. Um, we don't melt the plastic. So glue, it's... sorry, glue. Uh, the glue, the glue is dry. All right. When it's so the, the glue goes into a dryer or dehumidifier, which completely dries it out. Then when we heat it, it just makes it tacky. So there's no fumes that come there's off no out fumes. of it. Um, then we move on to the workbench. Um, these workbenches are height adjustable to suit different workers. Um, so we can fit a four foot five person on the workbench, or we can have a six foot three person working on exactly the same bench because it's height adjustable. Um, also, you can see here we have the heat gun on there, but. Um, workbench allows us to move it from side to side so for instance that's set up for a right-handed person if a left-handed person came in on the next shift and wanted to use it they're able to slide it all the way over to the other side so they can have it as comfortable as they want it as close as they want it and we can also use it for left-handed and right-handed people very good um, the workbench also allows for storage of components on the top which i'll go into a bit further detail in a bit um, this, um, the components being on the bench also allows for higher productivity for us as an organisation because they don't need to get up off their workbench in order to go to the parts, they're there in front of them. Everything they need is situated at that workbench for them to complete their process. Um, so on to the components. Um, obviously it's a key part of the layout. Um, we essentially did a spaghetti diagram which is a measurement tool that we use. Um, which measures, measures the distance that an associate would walk during the process time of any um, part. Um, so we worked out that there was quite a lot of motion waste from them having to get up and go and get their components in when they should essentially it would be save a lot of time for them just to be sat at the desk with all their parts where they need them. Um, so we store the components they need most on the bench so that they can just sit there and pick the parts when they need it. Um, all of the components on each workbench are also in sequence as well. So we've looked at the work instructions that they have to follow, and they go in sequence. So the first part that needs to be fitted is on the left, and the last part that needs to be fitted is on the right. So they can go through each one and pick it when they need it. You don't have to go from one side to the other, so it should make it slightly simpler for the associate. Very good. Um, because it's in sequence with the work instruction, they're a lot less likely to miss any components. Therefore, we create less defects, which is part of the uh, company strategy, zero defects. So we need to try and reduce it as much as we can. Therefore, that's something we've implemented to try and support the company strategy. Very good. Um, as for the chair, um, the chairs are ESD safe, electrostatic discharge safe. Um, this is mainly for the components. Obviously, we don't want any electrical charge in the uh, components when we assemble them. Otherwise, it can trip out the whole car. So it's important that we have uh, ESD safe chairs. Um, it also has height adjustments um, and uh, pelvic support. So uh, they're very expensive chairs because they have gone a lot into the design of how it supports the pelvis, how it supports the back. And they also have loads of adjustments. So you can slide the bottom forward. You can move the back up. You can tilt it, so there's lots of things that the associates can use in order to support themselves correctly when working. <coughs> um, so overall, the layout of the station fills a lot of the criteria because we've made sure it's safe. Um, we did have a few safety issues, like I said, with the heat gun burning people, but we've, we've made that safe now. So the chair is safe for the associates to use. So that generally fills a lot of the criteria that we will look for and also the high productivity so they don't have to get up from the workbench in the middle of the process. Um, Did you do measurements of like reach and work study of... We have done, however, the workbench needs to be 
um, suitable for all models. And the door panels, for instance, oh, right, yeah. on all models are different sizes. So we, our first priority is to make sure that the workbench is flexible. Because we have five different models, we can't have five different workbenches for each different model. Yep. Otherwise we'd have to have five times the amount of benches. So our main priority is that the benches are flexible so we can change models um, as and when we want. And again, that supports the company strategy and the flexibility part of we need to be able to make whatever the, com uh, the customer orders. Yeah. Um, into the future. So um, if there was money wasn't uh, an object and we could do whatever we wanted to do, automated leather covering, um, which I've researched online. Um, so a company called Kiva have designed a leather covering um, tool, uh, which essentially all the associate has to do is place the uh, plastic carrying part into the tool and the leather down the bottom presses a button and then it does all the work for them. It heats up the leather and the glue so it adheres correctly and then they just need to take it out. So for productivity and for health and safety, that would be a vast improvement, but then we need to work out whether that ties in with the Rolls-Royce strategy. It's meant to be handmade, so whether it does fit in or not, I'm not sure, but it's something that we could look for in the future, or maybe just to introduce in small bits yeah. So there are still bits of handmade going on in the workshop. Um, and also for the assembly, um, the automated screw-fed torque gun, um, which we have done trials on before, and I think it'd be a really valuable bit of kit to get in. Um, essentially, you can have it so that um, the screws that you require, that you put them straight in, and then the next screw comes out straight away. You can have it so it counts them, so it makes it pokey oak, because... Um, What's that? Pokio makes it impossible to get it wrong. So essentially, if um, an associate scans a barcode for the model it is, say if it's a Rolls Royce Phantom, it knows for a Rolls Royce Phantom door you need 15 silver screws, five black screws, and two clips. And that tool can load those up in that order so that you know that every single one is in place once you've completed that process. So I think that'd be really a bit of kits again. Very good. Okay. Any questions? No, thank you very much.